All right. Well, thank you for coming out here and uh, joining us uh, early this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about the COVID-19 vaccine um, and its immune response in patients with MS, as well as other autoimmune diseases, uh, while on certain therapies that are immune suppressing. And so just to give you a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about, First, before we get into talking about the vaccine, it's good to start out with the basics and learn about the immune system. I'm gonna tell you about the roles of the B and T cells, particularly as it pertains to uh, vaccination. Then we're gonna get into uh, what we know pre-COVID, it feels like a, a century ago, but pre-COVID, we'll talk about what we knew about the antibody response with certain DMTs, and then we're going to talk about what we have learned this far over the last two years or since the vaccine. So last year uh, with COVID in MS patients on certain uh, disease modifying therapies. And then I'm going to reveal some data that we had an opportunity to present at the American Academy of Neurology earlier uh, this month in Seattle from our study here uh, with perhaps patients sitting in this room. So thank you. Um, that uh, we were studying the immune response of the third dose or booster vaccine. All right, so just taking a step back, uh, this is a diagram of the immune system. You have two parts of the immune system. You have the innate immune system and you have the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is your memory uh, part of the immune system. And so when you're born, your innate immune system is there. That's what kicks in when you get any uh, kind of exposure as a kid to viruses, bacteria, the whole gamut of things. Um, the adaptive immune system is what we rely on as adults primarily. It's our memory immune system. And so this is the part of the immune system that matters when we're talking about vaccines. And it is uh, comprised of two components. You have your B cell part of the immune system and your B cells are the parts that make antibodies. So when you're exposed to a virus or an antigen, your B cells uh, learn what that is, make antibody in response to that uh, viral trigger. You have your T cell parts of the immune system. Again, that has memory T cells but these cells actually don't make the antibodies. You can kind of think of it as your second line of defense when you are exposed to an infection or a virus. So for instance, if you were vaccinated against COVID, you hopefully um, developed a B and T cell response and your B cells make antibodies that are constantly circulating in the blood. You also have some antibodies that are secreted into the mucosa, uh, which are IgA antibodies. And when you, um, when you are exposed to the virus, if you're having circulating antibodies, then those antibodies will bind that virus, clear it out. You never get infected. You never get sick. Now, Sometimes um, that part of the immune system fails. You don't clear the infection, the infection, you get enough of a viral load that the infection gets in regardless of your antibodies. And so when the virus gets into a cell, it starts replicating and it starts producing more virus. And then your T cell part of the immune system will kick in and say, hey, hey, this is not normal. This is not my normal self. And so it starts fighting off the virus then, okay? So that kind of sets the stage of what these B and T cells are doing. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about pre-COVID right, right here. This, um, I just wanna bring this up as we, as we introduce kind of what we learned about um, the COVID vaccine. So this particular study, the VELAS study, looked at patients with multiple sclerosis on a anti-CD20 called ocrelizumab, so very similar to rituximab, but this study was in ocrelizumab. And they looked at patients that were on other disease-modifying therapies that were not immune-suppressing, so interferons, 
and compared that to the patients that were on ocrelizumab. And they looked at different vaccines, and this included tetanus, flu, uh, pneumococcal vaccines. And then they also introduced something that was um, actually a novel protein or antigen called a uh, keyhole limpid uh, protein. And that is not a virus. That was just, hey, can your immune system recognize something new that you have never been exposed to before? Because most people as kids got, um, you know, either got influenza or got their vaccines throughout the years. And most kids got tetanus when they were babies. So that is a known antigen that your immune system has seen before. So this was testing something novel. And what they saw was that patients on ocrelizumab did have an attenuated or decreased antibody response to all of these vaccines. And it was lowest for the thing that was brand new, which was that keyhole limpets protein. Um, despite that, you know, it was felt that even though everyone had a decreased antibody response, it was felt that there was still some protective effect uh, to these vaccines. So the, the punchline was like, yes, they'll get your vaccines. They help. They're still protective, even though we're seeing this decreased antibody response. The key here is that this study did not look at the T cell response. Um, so this was strictly looking at those B cells and those antibodies. And we know that ocrelizumab as well as rituximab um, decrease uh, and basically uh, turn off those B cells. That's how it works. And so now where are we fast forward a couple years later, where are we with the COVID-19 vaccine? There has been a tremendous amount of interest, um, obviously, in studying the vaccine response in patients with MS on various disease modifying therapies. And um, I borrowed this slide from the AAN when this was presented. It's a nice summary of uh, basically all of um, different classes of disease modifying therapies that we see in MS. The majority of these, uh, of these studies basically looked at that antibody response. So humoral response, when you see it up here, that's that B cell antibody response. The majority of the studies studied that. There are a few studies that looked at this T cell response. Um, the vast majority of these studies, as you can see on this list, most patients on these drugs actually still had an antibody response. And that was with the exception of the anti-CD20s, which I already previewed a little bit and we'll get into some more and the S1P receptor modulators. And so those S1P receptor modulators think of things uh, like uh, fingolamide or gelenia, um, saponamod, ozonamod, okay? Um, these, uh, there's some studies on here that uh, did look at a T cell response. Funny enough with the S1P, one P receptor modulators. Uh, they there are some studies that looked at T cells. They seem to be suppressed both B, B and T cells. However, however, we are not seeing a tremendous amount of severe disease in these patients. So um, even though we did broader studies learning B and T cells, I, I think there's probably more to the story we actually perhaps don't know and need to study. Uh, when you look at the anti CD twenties. Studies are now looking at a T cell response, and I'll show you our data, but it is very clear that we're seeing a very robust T cell response. And so remember what I told you before, even though those antibodies might not clear that out, whether you have them or you don't, you still have that nice robust T cell response to kick in um, as second line defense. And so, this is our study that uh, we uh, did here at the University of Colorado. I want to thank everyone um, either here in the room or listening uh, from you know, your living room or wherever uh, for participating. If you participated, what we did here is we collected patients that had MS or another autoimmune neurologic disease such as uh, neuromyelitis optica or autoimmune encephalitis. And if you were on an anti-CD20 at the time, so think of things like rituximab and ocrelizumab, uh, we were looking at your immune response to the vaccine before and after you got your third dose um, of the COVID vaccine. And this was both in Pfizer and Moderna because it was just the mRNA vaccines. So this is a, just a very busy slide, but just to show you here kind of um, our, our method to the madness here in uh, the study design overview. 
We enrolled 34 patients that we followed longitudinally. The majority of those patients did have MS at 23, and then there were 11 with those um, other related autoimmune neurologic disorders. Um, the vast majority were on rituximab, but there was a mix uh, where we had ocrelizumab patients as well. Every patient that was enrolled was already on these medications. They received their two vaccine series, whether it was Pfizer or Moderna. Um, and then what we did was we collected before uh, the third dose or booster was planned. And that was on average about 30 weeks after the um, initial vaccine. And so um, we, I'm gonna show you some preliminary data here. This is still a work in progress. Uh, we ran the pre-sample, um, and I'm going to show you the data on all the 34 patients, but we're still analyzing those samples, those follow-up samples, four weeks and 12 weeks out. This is a very busy slide. Um, I don't expect you to really get into the nitty-gritty on, um, on the methods here, but just to uh, let you know, we did check B and T cell responses. We looked at uh, the B cell response by looking at an antibody assay that we have here on campus. And for the T cell assay, we actually looked at two of them. And so one of them was here on campus with Dr. Uh, Elena Sai's group here. Um, and we sent out another uh, sample out to a company called Euroimmune, which has a commercial T cell assay. So why the heck did we do this? Why, why two? T cell assays. Um, so T cells are much harder to test for than B cells. So the reason the majority of the studies that I showed you before looked at B cells is because it's an easier assay, more widely available. Um, I lost my timer. Um, so the, the T cells are very difficult, labor intensive, assays to do in the lab. And the, and the assay that we did here on campus is a research assay. It gets down to looking at exactly what T cells. So you look at your CD4 cells, CD8 cells, you're looking specifically at what those cells are doing and what their response are. Commercial assays are a little, what we call dirtier. They look at whole blood. You can't really narrow down the exact T cell. So we looked at both of these to say in the end, hey, is there a relationship? Can, uh, you know, is this, is this assay that's easier and cheaper and more widely available? Can we use that on a clinical basis? Does it correlate with what we see on the research assay? Um, and so I'm going to go through a little quickly because I lost my, I don't, I, how much time do I have? Oh, I'm good. Um, so these are the uh, participants we compared to healthy controls, um, as well as uh, the participants on these anti-CD20s. Um, pretty similar. The healthy controls were a little bit younger in age um, and a little more men in that group, uh, but uh, otherwise, you know, fairly similar there. Um, this is just a summary of what we saw and kind of what we expected and what goes along with what others have published, um, is that we saw this decreased antibody response, so the decreased B cell response um, of, of circulating antibodies or these IgGs, okay? So nothing unexpected necessarily here, and that was compared to those healthy controls. And um, I show on the slide here that this was this... This was before the third dose. The antibody response comes up a little bit after that second dose, but it's still suppressed um, compared to healthies that just got the two series or the two uh, vaccines with one series. Uh, when we look at T cell response, uh, we, you can see on this slide here in the black it are patients that uh, were normal healthy controls, got their two dose uh, vaccine. So Pfizer, Moderna, you have in red patients that were tested 
before vaccines were available, uh, these were unvaccinated individuals that were had severe COVID, were hospitalized. So we actually looked at what their T-cell response was shortly after hospitalization uh, with severe disease. And then in blue, we have our patients. It's labeled MS, but it's the group of MS and other autoimmune neurologic disease uh, on anti-CD20s. Um, and you can see here that it was statistically significant that this CD8 T cell response was more robust than normal healthies that got severe infection and normal healthies that got just the just the vaccine and no infection. So we use the euroimmune assay to look at things over time. And uh, the punchline here is that we also saw on this assay a very robust T cell response. And we can see here that before vaccine, that T cell response is there. After the third dose of vaccine, it goes up a little bit. Um, and we are still analyzing a lot of the 12 week follow up. However, we do see that um, that response seems to be sustained so far. And um, the punchline here is that we actually had to not use the standard commercial assay. We had to dilute it multiple times because the response was so strong, it was off the charts. So that's pretty good. So in summary, um, for our study, we, and again, confirming what a lot of others have seen in, in other institutions, we see this decreased antibody response in patients treated with anti-CD20 therapies compared to normal healthy controls. We do see this very robust uh, CD8 T cell response that is greatest in the anti-CD20 group, group compared to um, controls, and that included controls that were normal healthy people that got vaccinated as well as normal healthy people that just got COVID infection. Um, on the uh, commercial T cell assay that I showed you, again, we see a very positive immune response there. We're still analyzing um, a correlation between those two. So hopefully, uh, you know, if we, if we keep talking about this by the next Ed Summit, I'll, I'll have more data. Um, and uh, so what, what the heck do you do with this information? Um, I just want to take a step back, and Dr. Alvarez is going to get into this uh, a little bit more of just practical COVID um, things. But at the end of the day, looking at all of this vaccine data, a lot of people with autoimmune disease, a lot of people with MS, um, a lot of people in general have been vaccinated, uh, particularly with these mRNA vaccines. They were new. There was concerns about the technology maybe in the beginning, but a lot of people have been vaccinated. And um, overall, it seems safe. And um, it is highly recommended whether or not you're on these disease-modifying therapies that may dampen down the immune response you should get these vaccines. I mean, there's been no signal that it's worsening MS or anything like that. So these are considered safe vaccines. Now, clearly, you know, patients need to be on their disease modifying therapy. So what do we do now with this? Uh, well, I, I showed you from the data here that despite maybe seeing this blunted antibody response, we, at least in these anti-CD20s, we are seeing a very, very strong T cell response. And that is a good thing. And so the punchline is what that means is you might not be able to avoid infection with COVID. I mean, we know even we see patients that aren't on immune suppressing, don't have a normal immune system, and they still get breakthrough disease with these vaccines. Um, sometimes you can't avoid the infection. However, however, the infection is much, much, much more mild because your immune system is primed, those T cells are primed. And so even if you get that virus in a cell and it starts replicating, the infection is gonna be mild. So that's the good news. Um, if, you had, if, if you asked me, would I rather have a B cell response or a T cell response? I think the T cell response is actually the way to go because you know the B cell response fails sometimes and the T cell is kind of that second line and kicks in. So 
it does provide some level of immune protection and um, highly, highly encouraged to, to get vaccinated. And Dr. Alvarez is going to talk a little bit more um, about other therapies that we now have for COVID. One of them is called Evishield. So if um, what that is, is basically if you don't have that B cell response, we can give you medicines now that supplement those B cells. So you have those circulating antibodies as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Dr. Alvarez take over. Thank you. Thank you. 